Hello, my name is Yusuf Salibi. I am a retired emergency room physician and currently practice functional and integrative medicine. I'm the founder and director of the Carolina Holistic Medicine Centers in Merle's Inlet and Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. And I am also the director of Priority Health Academy, a non-governmental, non-profit organization dedicated to teaching advanced providers. Today I will be giving a talk on COVID-19 and the SARS-CoV-2 virus and the pandemic in general. Uh, the objectives for this talk will be to define the virus and the disease associated with it. In addition, a discussion about long COVID or long haulers. I will discuss how it is transmitted and how we can protect ourselves. We'll go over symptoms, pathophysiology, what I call the four pillars of a pandemic, and the nutraceutical bundle that is so important and so protective. We'll also discuss prescriptive for outpatient, and we'll talk about the vaccines that are available and if they should be called vaccines or in truth gene therapy. I'll also touch on the WHO, CDC, and how censorship has affected uh, the practice of medicine and research science in this country. I will have a few slides on the outpatient COVID protocols, and at the end of the session, there'll be time for some Q&A. Much of this presentation um, came from two presentations, one made by Dr. McCulley from Baylor uh, University Medical Center in Texas. Dr. McCulley is a pandemic specialist and has a medical degree along with a master's in public health. He gave an emergency webinar to the ILADS community of doctors back in uh, December of last year of 2020. And this is going to sort of highlight some of what he talked about. The SARS-CoV-2 virus, uh, the class was first discovered in the 1960s. There are seven human coronaviruses known to cause disease. This virus is a spherical enveloped virus that has club-like projections or spikes that are on the surface. And under electron microscopy, it gives the appearance of having a solar corona that you would see during a solar eclipse, hence the name. It is referred to as a large positive sense single strand RNA virus. For coronavirus genre, the COVID-19 is what we call a beta CoV. And it is likely to have originated in bats, but other reptiles like snakes and other animals can also uh, have been possibly uh, the origin. It's worth mentioning a few of the characteristic proteins that make up this virus. Uh, the most common that is heard about in the press is the S protein or the S spike protein, which um, mediates uh, the attachment of the virus to host cells. And uh, once this fusion occurs, the RNA or the DNA of a virus can actually be injected into the cell. The M protein is the most abundant protein on the virus, and it is, uh, defines the shape of the viral envelope. The E protein is the smallest of the major structural proteins and participates mostly in viral assembly and budding. The N protein is the only one that binds to the RNA genome and is also involved in viral assembly and budding. So how does this coronavirus infect cells, host cells? Well, replication of the coronavirus begins with the attachment and entry. Attachment of the virus to the host cell, in our case, the human cells, is initiated by interactions between the S spike proteins and the specific receptors, noted as ACE2 receptors for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Following receptor binding, the virus then enters the host cells, cytosol, which is the interior part of the, the 
host cell and cleaves the S protein by a polymerase enzyme, followed by fusion of the virus to cellular membranes. The next step is the translation of the replicase gene from the viron genomic RNA, and then translation and assembly of the viral replicase complex. Following replication and subgenomic RNA synthesis, encapsulation then occurs, resulting in the formation of a mature virus. Following assembly, virons are transported to the cell surface in vesicles and then released by exocytosis or cell lysis. So COVID-19 is a two-stage illness. The first phase of the infection begins like a viral syndrome, like what we would normally see with, let's say, the flu or the common cold. Its onset is fever, is the most common sign initially. And the other common uh, symptoms can include shortness of breath, a cough, diarrhea, and fatigue. And unique to this is the loss of smell, uh, the loss of the sense of smell, which we refer to as anosmia. The second phase of this infection has to do with a kind of uh, cytokine-related uh, release, or a cytokine storm. It begins around day seven, but differs significantly from one individual to the next. It includes more severe uh, manifestations or symptoms and can lead to life-threatening symptoms involving the respiratory tree, the cardiac, neurological, and other end organs. The second phase is also notable for its hypercoagulability or clot formations, such as pulmonary embolism, emboli, or DVT. The viral stage. So the innate immune system responds, govern initial viral infections. Now the innate immune system is the immune system, the one of the two main parts of our immune system that we are born with. It's kind of developed at the time of our birth as opposed to the adaptive, which matures and grows uh, as we age. Multiple host factors are at play in the innate immune response. Such conditions like diabetes and obesity are two of the greatest risk factors. Age is another one that can impact the immune function. The viral phase is governed by mild to absent symptoms. In some, we have oscillating fevers, diarrhea, fatigue, shortness of breath or dyspnea, cough, myalgias or muscle pains, and uniquely a nosmia, which is the loss of your sense of smell. If the viral stage is resolved by the host immune system, the severe, potentially lethal or life-threatening stages of the disease do not develop. Therefore, reducing viral replication is key to minimizing the clinical effects of, of COVID-19. Again, innate immune function and adaptive immune systems are two separate, but they work together. We are born with usually an intact innate system and the adaptive immune system, which is basically a lot of our immunoglobulins, our T cells and B cells, is something that matures as we get older. This is the um, system that is affected by vaccines or immunizations. Diabetes, obesity, age, and other chronic illnesses, such as autoimmune disorders, immune dysfunction, Lyme disease, and others, make, a, make that person that has these chronic illnesses at a higher risk. Current vaccines offered today are not true vaccines. They mount an adaptive immune response with IgG response is what a typical vaccine does. But rather, what they're offering today is something that um, is related to mRNA gene therapy. This is a science that was borrowed from oncology, where they have directed chemotherapy towards certain cancers using gene therapy. The proposed 
uh, mechanism of action is that this inoculation with this gene therapy will coat an invading virus and then shut it down. However, this may not happen as it's been engineered and may lead to a cloaking effect, whereas this material now will cloak the incoming invading virus and make it invisible to our innate natural killer cells, our cytotoxic T lymphocytes, and our antiviral macrophages. And if this happens, it can lead to viral sepsis and death. The stages of human cells becoming infected with the virus. So the virus will enter the host cells via the S spike proteins binding to the ACE2 receptors. What is referred to as a positive single strain RNA virus will then start to replicate. There is an enzyme called replicase that's involved and there's a gene that carries the coding for that that takes over the cells and produces what they call negative SSRNA, which then is sort of the blueprint for creating massive amounts of positive SSRNA copies in the Golgi bodies and the endoplasmic reticulum in each and every one of our cells. When this happens, there are thousands and thousands of copies that are generated of this invading virus. They are expelled via a process called cell lysis. Newly formed capsids use host cell membranes often to envelop them. So they use part of our existing cell wall to help envelop the new formed viruses. New viruses then go on to infect other host cells exponentially. It is very important to realize that it is at this stage where propagation and early infection of the virus is occurring that we can mitigate or stop the infection. And if we can do that, we can essentially end the pandemic. This slide illustrates the viral replication and what happens next, um, the cytokine storm and then following the most deadly part, which is the microthrombus. Now, this is also on a timeline from day zero on to day 30. And you can see if the infection and the viral replication go unchecked, there will be a cytokine storm that develops in crescendos, and then it causes end organ damage, like damage to the lungs, uh, thrombotic disease. And at that point, um, it's an uphill battle to try to save uh, a patient that far along in the course. This slide illustrates the milieu of inflammatory uh, agents. Uh, one of the most important ones is on the far left under TH17, which is IL-6 or interleukin-6. Another one is tumor necrosis factor alpha or TNF-alpha. I'd also like to point out the one that uh, is IL-1B. So remember interleukin-1B, I'll be bringing that up a little bit later. But there are also some uh, inflammatory markers that are helpful to us, uh, like IL-10 and TGF-beta. So some of those things keep in balance the pro-inflammatory cytokines and the anti-inflammatory cytokines. So it's a kind of a balancing act. When that is tilted to the left is when we have runaway inflammation and uh, it causes end organ damage. I'll briefly go over some additional information about cytokines and inflammation. So cytokine storm leads to inflammation. And when you have a lot of inflammation, that's what does most of the damage. Cytokine spikes were identified in 1993 in graft versus host conditions. And this is where um, doctors and researchers were looking at transplants, uh, organ transplants. And we see this sort of thing happen with cytokine storms and inflammation in CMV, cytomegalovirus, EBV, Epstein-Barr virus, group A strep, and some other additional viruses, including the ones we're dealing with now, the SRS-CoVID-2. 
Cytokines involved are classified as interferon, interleukins, as I mentioned, IL-6 or interleukin-6 is one of the chief ones, chemokines, and tumor necrosis factor, which is a prominent cytokine. It is worth noting that antibodies produced by our immune system to the SARS-CoV-2 virus tend to cross-react with 28 known human tissues. This is how COVID virus antibodies lead to autoimmune conditions. This was reported recently in a January 2002 research paper. Antibodies like the M2 antibody, which will attack the mitochondria, may explain the fatigue. Antibodies pushing up zonulin levels in the gut may explain the GI symptoms. This slide depicts a graphic of uh, the human body and the end organs that are affected. The lungs, the liver, kidneys, intestines, the brain and neurological systems, the eyes, the nose, and the heart and blood vessels. Now we'll discuss some treatments and some preventive measures. So we'll move on now to natural supplements used in both the prevention and the early stages, or what we call phase one, of the infection. It is imperative that everyone know that these nutraceutical bundles or supplements are very important for each and every human being to be on continuously until after the pandemic is over. Chief among them is zinc. This element has been studied and reported that intracellular zinc can basically shut down viral replication and halt the spread and propagation of the illness. Quercetin is an inophore, which is a agent that actually helps push in certain minerals into cells. In this case, quercetin pushes zinc into the intracellular space from the extracellular space, which is the bloodstream. It also does a lot more, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Vitamin C is very important as an antiviral, as a agent that helps uh, the immune system, and it also helps recycle the quercetin. We'll talk about that also. And then very importantly, vitamin D. I prefer vitamin D3. And there's plenty of research to show that elderly folks uh, who suffered or who uh, died from the COVID infection had very low levels, serum levels of vitamin D. Those that tended to survive or do very well had higher levels. High dose melatonin is on some protocols as is N-acetyl-L-cysteine or NAC and glutathione and curcumin. So curcumin was studied uh, during the Brazil Olympic Games because they were looking for natural agents that might help stop envelope viruses from sticking or attaching to cells. And uh, it was studied with the influenza virus, the chikungunya, the Zika virus, and it was found to be very effective actually if you were taking curcumin or turmeric for the S spike proteins on all those different viruses to not necessarily adhere very well to human cells. So that's why that one is on there. Additionally, some things you can add on to the basic foundational nutraceutical bundle are the following. Medicinal mushrooms. I personally like to use those as they enhance the immune system. Host Defense has a number of great uh, products, as does Metagenics Immucor, which I think is a very well balanced and I use it a lot in my practice. Uh, adaptogen herbs are also um, a fundamental important uh, herbal, if you wish to add that, for the immune system and to uh, reduce inflammation. A product by Biobotanical Research called Biocidin, it's a liposomal form, which is a, a spray. And you can keep that in your fridge and use that for a, a wide variety of infections it's been studied well in some teaching institutions such as Johns Hopkins to be shown very effective in fighting viruses, bacteria, parasites, and fungi. 
I'll mention elderberry because I know a lot of folks are on elderberry um, extracts, and that's a okay if you're try if you're using it for limited periods of time, let's say during the flu season or whatnot. But there has been some studies to suggest, and these are published papers, that interleukin 1b, and remember I asked you to remember that as one of the inflammatory cytokines, um, tends to be uh, increased with elderberry once the infection has set in. So it's advised to stop taking this at the first signs of infection, but you can take it up to that point to help with your immune system. EGCG is an extract from black tea, and that is in some protocols. Uh, rutin and lutein um, are also naturally occurring substances, like lutein, um, that are helpful. Alpha lipoic acid, ALA, that is in some protocols, and if you take ALA and NAC, they help produce your own glutathione. Now, if you notice, there's an asterisk here, and there was an asterisk on the glutathione. And that is because if you have a very high heavy metal burden, taking uh, too much ALA or too much glutathione can actually pull the heavy metals that are in storage, whether they're in deep uh, tissues like fat cells, adipocytes, or in the bone, uh, they may pull it out and you may become transiently toxic or sick from that. Speaking of metals, colloidal silver is one that some people use as an antimicrobial uh, against viruses, bacteria, parasites. It is a heavy metal, so you have to be careful with it, and you do not want to use this for extended periods of time. Dr. Christine Jadroak, uh, a practicing uh, physician in New Jersey, had mentioned a couple of other agents that she uses in her uh, protocol. One is butyrate, and the other is phosphatidylcholine. So butyrate is actually produced by the good bacteria in the gut. So if you've got a good microbiome in your intestines, you should be, they should be butyrate producing. Uh, it does lower IL-6, and it also aids in the enhancement of things called resolvins and protectins, which themselves reduce inflammation. PC is a reducer of tumor necrosis factor alpha, or TNF-alpha. So those two agents can be used. I haven't really been prescribing them, uh, but they are available and there's some research to back them up. Again, beyond phase one, I want to re-emphasize the nutraceutical bundle should be used before an infection starts. So this is a prophylactic use of these agents. And it is my opinion that everyone should be on these, adults, children, the elderly, um, the nutraceutical bundle and some medications should be used for prophylaxis to prevent infections in those at high risk. And once infection is detected by positive testing or by assumption that one is exposed or has this, even if it's a false, it could be a false negative test, then you want to go on the medications for sure. We'll discuss those briefly. This is to prevent long haul or what they call long haulers or long COVID or some are referring to this as post COVID syndrome. So sometimes we'll have to take this nutraceutical bundle for an extended period of time to prevent these things from happening. The nutraceutical bundle should not be stopped under any circumstances if a subject is admitted to the hospital. It should be added on to. There are other agents like corticosteroids that should not be used early on and in the early parts unless respiratory issues develop. They can be detrimental. But in the hospital setting, the hospital protocols actually utilize intravenous or inhaled corticosteroids to help suppress the inflammation that's gone rampant. But there's no call to stop the nutraceutical bundles such as zinc, vitamin C, vitamin D, quercetin. If thrombosis is suspected, or clotting, that is, like deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary emboli, adding aspirin uh, is a good idea, or other agents to reduce emboli and hypercoagulable states. 
it's suggested that you add those and some of them are actually are injectables that thin the blood. It is worth noting that 35% of non-hospitalized COVID infected patients did not return to their normal level of health within the first 21 days after being infected. This is far higher than what we see with the seasonal flu, which is about 10%. Everyone in academia screams for evidence-based medicine, or what we call EBV. And in actuality, it depends on who's reading and what journals are being read uh, that matters. Uh, there are lots of, lots of information out there, and the, the amount of retractions in the last decade has, has been sort of exponential. It's, it's no time in medical history has there been so many retractions of papers, either political or they were just poorly put together scientifically and they're redacted because they're just bad articles. But there seems to be a political event uh, bent uh, in, recent, in recent months. But there's a tremendous amount of information on the uh, nutraceuticals that I've mentioned and some of the medications. For instance, the role of zinc as an antiviral came out this year, or I'm sorry, last year, um, in the Advances in Nutrition Journal in 2019. The re more recently, the Pediatric Journal in, in Italy, a Pediatric Journal published something on nutraceutical supplements or nutritional supplements as being a therapeutic adjunct to COVID-19. And that was published this year in 2021. The paper that got me in trouble with Facebook because I was censored by reposting a 10 year old article. And again, this was published in 2010 and there were two additional articles of the same year published showing intracellular zinc inhibiting coronaviruses and as an antivirus. Now we didn't know about COVID-19 back in 2010, but we did know about coronaviruses. We knew about Zika virus. We knew about chikungunya and dengue fever. All these different viruses seem to be stopped cold in their tracks by higher, do higher levels of zinc in the cell. So it's been very well established and um, there have been doctors that have uh, realized this and started implementing this uh, fact in some of their protocols. Because quercetin is such a uh, important part of the protocol, let me mention a little bit more about it. It's widely distributed as a plant flavonoid, so it's in lots of uh, vegetables and plants. Uh, it's found in red onions, it's found in the skins of citrus fruits and in broccoli. Um, so it's a very natural thing. It's not bitter tasting at all. Uh, studies suggest that quercetin supplementation may promote antioxidant and anti-inflammatory, antiviral and immunoprotective effects. Now there is a caveat about it because while it is an antioxidant, in some cases it can be a pro-oxidant um, if it doesn't get recycled uh, and that's done with vitamin C. So there's many studies to show its effects, its mechanisms of action inhibiting things like polymerases and proteases and suppressing DNA gyrase uh, and binding to viral capsid proteins. Uh, studies also suggest that it enhances natural killer cells and their lytic activities and chemokines or chemotaxins. Um, quercetin also binds the SARS-CoV-2 protease and inhibits its proteolytic activity. Because quercetin, I mentioned earlier, is an anti and a pro-oxidant, it is advised to take vitamin C in adequate doses in order to recycle the quercetin back into its antioxidant state. This slide uh, was put up in early February of 2021, and I'm not gonna read all this, but it basically demonstrates the vitamin D for COVID-19 is in fact been studied, studied a lot, 48 studies on that alone, by quite a number of scientists with sufficient data and statistical significance that it works 
against the COVID virus. So if you hear people mumbling about on the internet that vitamin D doesn't work, well, that's just plain fake news, if you ask me. Okay, now let's jump into some of the pharmaceuticals. So these are basically the prescriptives. These are, can be used as prophylaxis in certain doses, but if there is a positive test or an exposure or very early signs and symptoms of this disease, then it is highly recommended that you go on some or all of these. So the first one I'll mention is hydroxychloroquine, HCQ, because it's been in the news a lot. It's been vilified, unjustly so. I mean, this drug's been around for a long time. It's uh, been used by rheumatologists and rheumatoid arthritis patients. It, it saw its birth as a, an agent against malaria. So it's been used for many, many years to treat that as an anti-parasitic intracellular drug. Uh, there are side effects, but nothing that's been uh, represented in the press lately. Its sister chloroquine or quinine is also another agent. The next one is ivermectin, IVM. Ivermectin is another antiparasitic that has uh, the ability to reduce inflammation and to fight viruses. Azithromycin, most people may know that as the Z-Pak, is a macrolide antibiotic that appears to have some antiviral effects. Doxycycline is another long time, been around for a long time, uh, antibiotic used for a number of things. We, we treat MRSA infections with it. Um, so it is used to treat a lot of illnesses, including pneumonia, etc. And uh, while we were told in medical school when I was there that antibiotics didn't work against viruses, I guess that information is a bit dated because we may not understand the mechanisms necessarily, but azithromycin and doxycycline have use with either hydroxychloroquine or iver ivermectin in treating COVID. Now, for patients already on low-dose naltrexone or LDN, that's to their benefit as that has been shown to help enhance the immune system. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily start it acutely on somebody who is acutely ill because it usually takes a little bit of time for LDN to work and you have to titrate the doses up from one to about four and a half milligrams. An alternative to ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine is nitrosoxanide. Uh, it is brand name Alenia. Again, it's another parasitic, it's FDA approved for the treatment of infectious diarrhea, but it has, and it is an interesting drug and it has some interesting uses in antiviral. I've used this personally on myself when um, I was exposed or came down with early signs of a viral infection and it works amazingly well. Um, it ha there are a couple clinical trials, but I put an asterisk here because there's nothing real definitive yet, but theoretically we know it works and anecdotally we've seen it happen and observed it in clinical practice. Uh, so this would not be my first choice, but um, if somebody cannot tolerate or cannot get hydroxychloroquine or ivermectin, then I will use Alenia. Alenia, by the way, is in clinical trial as an anti-cancer therapy. So this drug is an unusual drug. There's also the use of monoclonal antibodies, or MABs. This is an IV infusion, and there are at least three or four now on the market that are FDA approved for use as a one-time infusion early on in the disease process. You don't use this particularly in inpatient therapy but it is expensive. I think the one of them is about $1,600 per infusion, and there's another combo uh, that are together about $3,000 per infusion. I don't use them for that reason, and I'm not 100% convinced that those uh, MABs are um, that all that effective for the price you're paying. There's also some novel antivirals that have come on the scene. One in particular that's very popular is remdesivir, um, and there's debate as to whether that's that effective or not. But again, it's an IV therapy. You get a daily IV infusion for multiple days, and if you're an outpatient, it's not that practical. 
you know, we want a pill. We don't want something you have to get by IV. And then finally, there's the convalescent plasma immunoglobulins, IgGs, that are pooled from donors. These are people who've had the coronavirus and they generate IgGs that protect them and it's uh, donated or they go to the blood bank and they get um, blood drawn and it's pooled and cleaned up and then given to patients. And uh, it appears to work. We're, it's, again, not a very strong thing, but uh, it appears now with these variants that uh, they don't work so great against these variants. So this talk basically is limiting itself to outpatient early interventions. So I will leave uh, just a mention, a brief mention of one of the inpatient protocols. Quite a little bit different, but uh, this is what goes on once you're admitted to the hospital um, and uh, things go, go up a few notches. Again, this slide is up for all the hydroxychloroquine haters, um, uh, the deniers. Uh, there's been um, probably at this point over 204 trials with over 3,000 scientists looking at this drug for the COVID um, pandemic. And the data is very strong that this is an effective treatment. And this was something, this was a slide that was put up in a presentation February 14th of this year. So I'm not going to read all this, but it, again, it just goes to show you that there is um, some maligning of this particular drug uh, for maybe some obvious reasons. But that's all I'll say about that. And this slide is one that uh, looks at ivermectin for the treatment of COVID. Again, th at least 36 trials, over 250 scientists, and, and quite a number of patients in some randomized controlled trials. Again, this seems to be a potent and effective and safe treatment for COVID-19. And again, this is um, probably one of my favorite choices of an intervention because it can be used prophylactically and it can be used uh, directly in early treatment and should be continued during hospitalizations. Ivermectin, again, is my first choice because of its long standing safety record and its near nil drug drug interaction. A little bit about ivermectin, it was discovered in 1975 and uh, was used to treat folks with river blindness in the Amazon and some other rivers. And uh, it's a great anti-parasitic and anti-hermetic, so it, it removes worms, it's a dewormer. Very successful, effective, and cost effective for the treatment of COVID-19. Many doctors that use this have reported very, very few hospitalizations and almost no deaths for people who were started on this early, early on. It is commercially available in three milligram tablets, but you can get a compounding pharmacy to make the more appropriate dose, which are usually 18 milligram capsules. Ivermectin has been very useful and effective in, against Zika virus, influenza, dengue, and um, even in some of our chronic Lyme and co-infection patients. The mechanism of action, at least part of it, is that it works on NF-kappa B. Prophylaxis, or to prevent what we call post-COVID syndrome or long COVID, is typically an 18 milligram capsule taking weekly for a month or longer. Um, if you're treating the disease of COVID infection that manifests in more significant manifestations, then it is recommended 18 milligrams either every day or since it is a long acting drug, you can get by with taking it every other day for 10 days. Then I would suggest, as some others have, that you take it for another month to six weeks but do this weekly at a lower dose per week. So once a week, uh, this will help reduce the risk of long COVID or post COVID syndrome. Hydroxychloroquine is a different dose, obviously. It's 200 milligrams twice a day. 
and for prophylaxis you can take 200 milligrams twice weekly. This might actually be preferred uh, to ivermectin if a patient presents that has autoimmune diseases because hydroxychloroquine is very helpful in uh, folks with autoimmune it's actually prescribed for them so if you see that in their past medical history that might be something to sway your decision this is a slide from a presentation that was made a couple of months ago uh, so it's a little bit dated but I threw it up here just to illustrate a few facts I agree with most of it except the, the information on the very top about hydroxychloroquine uh, where they're sending, uh, stating that there's no benefit or even a tend to harm in late disease, and that's just not true. Uh, but I will kind of agree with the rest of it, uh, talking about remdesivir um, and some other monoclonal antibodies, uh, even convalescent serum um, it may not be that effective um, in uh, the symptom phase or definitely in the late phase. And uh, corticosteroids, again, should not be used to, in prevention, um, and um, they may tend to harm uh, in the symptomatic phase, but obviously when there's lots of pulmonary inflammation, then you're, you have to use corticosteroids, and they are beneficial. But if you look at ivermectin at the very bottom, there seems to be benefit in all three phases. So that's why that has come up to the top of the list for drug intervention. I want to discuss now what we call the four pillars of a pandemic response. So any pandemic specialist will know this and adhere to it. And those at the CDC and the World Health Organization know this. And um, it is kind of, we've been beaten into submission with the mask wearing, social distancing, quarantine, and uh, hand washing, all that proper hygiene, which all makes sense in the sense that, you know, if you're sick, stay at home, uh, don't expose other people. There are some things about the masks that um, don't make sense. Um, mask is, the masks that, they're, that are available to the public are um, not very effective, to be frankly honest. And there have been some studies like the uh, Denmark mask study to show that it's really not effective. Um, but uh, those sort of things make up the first pillar. So contagion control, stop the spread of the virus, number, number one, first pillar. Um, I'm going to skip over the second pillar for now because I'm going to come back to that. But the third pillar is hospitalization, late stage treatments, and hospital interventions. And of course, the fourth pillar, which is we see in the news quite a bit about, is vaccine development and implant. Imp implementation for herd immunity. So the absolute most important of these four pillars is the second pillar. And there's been hardly any mention of it in the media amongst doctors. There are many physicians out there, the vast majority to this point, and I'm talking, we're in the middle of February, 2021, and it blows my mind that there are very few physicians that are actually implementing the second pillar. It is so very important, and this is the way you stop a pandemic. We don't have time to wait for the vaccines to work. We don't know that they will, but we do know we have agents in hand on the shelves of every pharmacy that will knock out this pandemic and save lives. This slide from Dr. McCulley's uh, presentation demonstrates that with early multidrug interventions, you can keep uh, people in an ambulatory situation, in other words, not having to go into the hospital. So 97.8% people remained ambulatory, only 2.2% uh, were had to be hospitalized, and there was a death rate of 0.3%. Now, uh, once people are admitted to the hospital, the death rate goes up significantly. So the number one goal should be to keep people out of the hospital with early interventions with multi-supplement and multi-drug therapy. This slide demonstrates uh, what we call COVID kits, treatment kits. And uh, this is being implemented all over the world except in our nation. It's embarrassing to say that you know we're one of the greatest nations on the planet or we, we 
tout ourselves to be, and yet we are way behind uh, some third world countries. So in Brazil, uh, they give out these uh, COVID kits that contain the, diet, the, the dietary supplements or the nutraceutical bundles along with some of the medications like ivermectin, for instance. Um, you'll see this being given out to people testing positive in El Salvador, in Guatemala, and in uh, India. And it's just a, a great shame that we are not implementing this in this country. I can't give this talk without talking a little bit about what's happening in the world and in our nation. And this has to do with the World Health Organization and the CDC actually dropping the ball on this pandemic. Uh, there was a lot of confusion early on, but it, that should have been cleared up within one or two months. But this is dragged out for way too long and is very chaotic and has actually cost lives. It all has to do with the medical industrial complex. Now, President Eisenhower warned us Americans uh, as he was leaving office about the military industrial complex. But we now have a medical industrial complex that actually saw the birth right after the Civil War when pharmaceutical companies came into power. And it's just gotten worse with big pharma, with the large hospital systems, the kind of standard uh, of care of medicine uh, that we're seeing, the current par paradigm that we're in, and also insurance companies. And um, on top of that to insult, to add more insult to injury, is the censorship in the scientific and research communities. Um, you know, we can question evidence-based medicine because I mentioned earlier the number of retractions in our peer-reviewed journals is at an all-time high and has been escalating exponentially for the last decade. We have lost trust in mainstream conventional medicine. There's a lot of people that are disenchanted and feel disenfranchised, both practitioners and patients. Trust and transparency has crumbled with our government agencies and big pharma. And censorship of well-intentioned doctors and researchers is dangerous not only for our democracy, but is dangerous for our own health. And the public, because of this censorship, has suffered tremendously. This is a very poignant image as it reflects the system that has basically turned its back on its patients. I found this slide in a uh, presentation given by Dr. Merritt. Um, she had posted this as one of her slides. It's pretty humorous. Uh, so here we see a gentleman in a, um, a viral lab, a virologist, and he's in a very airtight, almost hazmat suit with with thick gloves, duct tape around his wrists, and the yellow tubing there is actually pumping in fresh, clean air for him to breathe. So this is the way a virologist uh, protects themselves from a virus. And the joke is that that little bandana you wear around your mouth, well, it may work too, not really. Very, very few masks out there, even the N95 or the R and P95 masks were not engineered and designed for viruses, which are very small micron, like 0.125 micron in, length, in, in size. What they're designed for is to keep tuberculous organisms, which are greater than 3.0 microns. That's what it's designed for. And in addition to that, it needs to be fit tested or fitted to be used properly. You can't just get one out of the box and put it on and expect it to work. So the whole mask thing as a form of protection, and now they're asking us to double mask, is absolutely ludicrous. It doesn't really work. It doesn't really protect it. Those masks are not designed for that purpose. Surgical masks are designed to keep surgeons' microbes from their mouth and nose from entering in the operating field, the operative field. It's not meant to prevent the spread of coronavirus. And that is another hour-long lecture. I will also have to say that talking about the current vaccines on the market, and now there are four, 
um, and they're all getting emergency use um, uh, by the FDA. Um, there, again, is a lot to be said about this therapy or this intervention. Uh, I could spend a full hour just talking about it, but I'll summarize by saying very clearly that the COVID vaccine is not in either the legal or the medical definition of a vaccine. A vaccine is what we're familiar with with influenza or the flu vaccine or the tetanus toxoid vaccine or the hepatitis B vaccine. It is an antigen um, that will be introduced that will not cause the disease but will actually alert or awaken the immune system, the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system to take action to bolster up defenses so that if you're ever exposed to those viruses that you'll have an added level of protection and it will stop the spread of an infection. That's how vaccines work. What we're seeing now is the engineering of gene therapy. They have stolen this idea from oncology where they're using directed gene therapy to attack cancers. So the patents for these are actually considered chemotherapeutic agents. When injected with this substance, it will alter forever the way your body handles, the way your cells will start producing certain proteins. So this is a, you can't take this back once you get the uh, inoculation of this agent, it will alter you. You become genetically altered in a way um, and it will produce what they want it to do is they want it to produce a coating of the S spike to actually, uh, when you're um, attacked by a virus, it will coat this and take it out of play. So your body will produce um, something with an affinity for the S spike proteins, will cover it and it should take it out of play or take it out of action. But what may happen is that it, as it's coating it, it's cloaking it. So it, be, it makes the invading virus sort of invisible to our immune cells. And that can be very detrimental. It shuts down our number one um, uh, area of defense and it can lead to viral sepsis and that can lead to death. So again, this slide is actually a little text heavy, but it just uh, goes over what I just mentioned, that uh, a true vaccine generates an IgG response in our adaptive immune system. And these little snippets of uh, genetic material of uh, single strand RNA in these viruses uh, are actually things to try to mitigate the symptoms of your disease, not actually spark an immune response. So we have to be super careful about this. Think long and hard before you jump in front of somebody in line to get your vaccine. Uh, I, can, I am not going to take it currently. And I'm going to wait and see um, how this all pans out. Uh, I, don't, I cannot believe that uh, the pharmaceutical industry and our government agencies are telling us this is a safe vaccine. You cannot say that honestly and truthfully unless something's been around five or 10 years. So um, I, I don't believe them when they say that this vaccine or these vaccines are safe. The other thing is, is the way these are designed or engineered, it is very easily weaponized. So some sort of dubious uh, entity or foreign government that's an enemy of the United States may actually be able to weaponize this virus with subsequent uh, viral injections or vaccines. I would like to start winding down this talk with uh, some discussions and some slides of uh, the protocols that have been vetted out, that have been validated by being published in medical journals and peer reviewed. Dr. McCulley out of Baylor uh, University Medical Center in Texas actually presented uh, recently in um, middle of December of 2020. And as he was presenting, this was being uh, uh, validated in a peer review journal uh, and has been published. This is my favorite of the protocols that are out there. 
I do, I do borrow and steal from other ones, but essentially the nutraceutical bundle of zinc, vitamin D, vitamin C, and quercetin are the foundation building blocks. Um, again, if people are testing positive uh, or becoming symptomatic, we start using ivermectin, azithromycin, uh, sometimes we use doxy, sometimes we'll use hydroxychloroquine. Uh, the other agent listed there in the right-hand side is not available in the United States right now. It is an antiviral that is available in Europe. And if respiratory symptoms develop, we use inhaled uh, corticosteroids, or uh, if they get worse, we use oral uh, corticosteroids. Coltracine is another agent that can help with inflammation. At that point, sometimes we're using high doses of melatonin. And uh, if this situation gets worse, we then start looking at um, prevention of um, thrombotic events uh, by using aspirin, uh, low molecular weight heparin, which is also has some anti-inflammatory properties to it. But there are also some other injectable uh, agents to help with uh, preventing emboli, DVT, and pulmonary embolism. This is a slide from Dr. Zelenko's protocol. If you recall, he made the headlines um, early on in the pandemic, I think around uh, May or so, when he came up with the protocol. Again, lay, um, uh, laying heavily on um, zinc therapy with quercetin, he does use EGCG, but again, also represented there as vitamin C and vitamin D. So early on, he kind of brought awareness to the use of zinc and getting intracellular zinc up. So this is his protocol that was um, written and published. This protocol by Dr. Joseph Musto, um, who is the director of laboratory medicine um, in Massachusetts, uh, worked alongside Dr. Horowitz and uh, Dr. Zelenko and a few others. Uh, to come up with a more expanded protocol. Here they're using a, a fair amount of glutathione and N-acetylcysteine. Uh, alpha lipoic acid is represented here. But again, the basics, zinc, vitamin D3, vitamin C, uh, multivitamins. Um, they mention colloidal silver here. And uh, again, they look at ivermectin. Uh, they look at hydroxychloroquine. Uh, they're looking at nitrous oxide, which is Alenia, along with azithromycin. So these are um, very similar um, you know, protocols. There's a lot of good overlap, which gives me great comfort to know that a lot of minds are working on this and come to a consensus. It's quite easy if you've got uh, little ones in the house, uh, children, adolescents, uh, people who don't like swallowing pills. It's easy to get on the uh, protocol with chewables or gummies uh, or dissolvable tablets. Um, so it, it can be done. It should be done. Everyone in the household should be on, on the nutraceutical bundle. Some com companies out there, uh, Metagenics is one. It's a very high-end uh, nutraceutical, pharmaceutical grade company. Um, their stuff is excellent and they've kind of come up with uh, a bundle. They call it their immune defense pack. And it basically has all the agents that you'll need in the nutraceutical bundle packaged nicely in one box. So uh, it comes in these packets and it'll basically uh, cover you. So that makes it very easy. I'll give you some resources. So at this point, if you want to take a screen uh, shot of this, um, it might be helpful so you can rec uh, remember the uh, URLs. So um, a wellness blog that I contribute to almost on a daily basis on all things functional medicine and now heavy with COVID updates is my blog at docsalibi.blogspot.com. Come please follow us there. I've been blogging for almost 15, 20 years on this site. Um, prior to this, um, really, I was used doing a lot of Facebook, but since I was censored, I've lost faith in Facebook's uh, ability to really tweet out um, fact from fiction. 
Um, so um, I've been relying on publishing most of my blog op-eds and things and information on this site. So please follow us there. If somebody is interested in um, kind of the full spectrum of all the nutraceuticals mentioned and what I have been uh, getting my patients to get started on and take during the pandemic, uh, you can um, come and register for free on Fullscript. And this URL is the direct link to our Fullscript page with Carolina Holistic Medicine. That's my clinical practice. And uh, it is an international company headquartered out of Canada. Uh, they have a great formulary of very high-end pharmaceutical grade nutraceuticals. So you're gonna only gonna get the best stuff. Uh, if you sign up, it's free and there's no obligation to purchase anything. Uh, but if you do, there'll be an automatic 10% discount for folks that sign up. And I will personally send you uh, your first recommendations which is the entire protocol and supporting uh, information uh, in the first uh, recommendations or prescription, if you will, uh, that is sent out once you have uh, created an account. I'd like to start wrapping up uh, with conclusions. Well, first of all, COVID-19 pandemic is a global disaster, both for health concerns and economies. The pathophysiology is very complex and we're still learning. It's an evolving situation. Despite contagion control efforts, the outbreak has worsened with two very poor outcomes, hospitalizations and death. Hospitalizations and late treatment uh, form an inadequate safety net, uh, which is unacceptable because of the high mortality. So it's imperative to lean on that second pillar of early outpatient uh, healthcare delivery uh, to stem, stem the tide of this pandemic. Early home treatments with sequenced multi-supplement, multi-drug regimen has a reasonable chance of success with a well-characterized safety profile, okay? So we wanna reduce hospitalizations and death and uh, we want this to be resolved. And this is really, uh, with or without a vaccine and herd immunity, this is uh, the best, most important step to take. So another couple of few points, uh, consider prophylactic strategies uh, with patients. That should be foremost on every physician's mind. Act early during the viral phase, the earlier the better. And if you're on this stuff prophylactically, you're way ahead of the game. And one thing to remember is don't uh, break the fever. Um, the fever is the body's way of helping fight infections, especially viral infections. So if you're running 99.8 or 100.1 even, uh, don't be so quick to get uh, Tylenol or Motrin in your system, especially in our pediatric uh, population. Let the fever go and do its job. Uh, only use uh, anti-fever uh, medications, antipyretics, uh, in the situations where you're uncomfortable, like really uncomfortable with the fever, or it's, you know, in exceeding 104. Uh, but let the fever do its job. And I, I want to say, consider ivermectin as your number one choice. And don't forget the nutraceutical bundles go along with that. Zinc, quercetin, vitamin C, vitamin D. You can add NAC, you can add glutathione uh, with certain caveats. Um, there are other agents you can use medicinal mushrooms, adaptogens, etc., to bolster your immune system. And to uh, act as anti-inflammatories, you can consider uh, phosphatidylcholine and uh, butyrate. There has been a lot of crazy stuff going on and people doing some really ludicrous things. Uh, with this pandemic and it just never ceases to amaze me or entertain me when I see ridiculous stuff. This was a photograph of uh, a woman visiting her elderly mother and in order for them not to, uh, you know, break the boundaries of, um, you know, social distancing, they actually put a sheet of plastic between them. Now this is in no way gonna protect you from the virus particles, 
uh, there's been a study that shows that if somebody is just speaking that viral particulate matter, it's not six feet or eight feet, it was measured at something like 27.2 feet. And this was done in a research setting. So these tiny min minuscule uh, particles can travel quite a distance. And uh, it's not like the heavy, large particles like blood splatter and things like that. We're talking, these are tiny, tiny little uh, microns, uh, less than one micron in size and they can travel quite a distance. So don't fool yourself by thinking a shield or a mask uh, will protect you. If you really wanna be protected, you'll get a big hazmat suit like the virologists use in their laboratory. I'd like to uh, put these references and acknowledgements in here. You can read these. Uh, some of the slides uh, I have borrowed from presentations from Dr. McCulloch and Dr. G. Doric. Um, so um, just want to reach out and thank them for their presentations and their slides. And you might be asking, well, where can I get help? Well, um, you know, my clinical practice in functional medicine was mostly hormone balance, some anti-aging stuff and working with folks with autoimmune disorders. But when I realized that physicians out there were not doing what they should be doing, not only was I incensed, but it was a call to action for me to uh, train up my nurse practitioners in the center to become uh, kind of rapid frontliners for COVID to provide our patients and also new patients coming into the practice that uh, test positive or suspect they have COVID uh, by giving them the nutraceutical bundles and the pharmaceuticals they need to keep out of the hospital and keep alive. So uh, if you're interested in or need the services, carolinaholisticmedicine.com or our toll-free number 800-965-8482, and that serves both locales and our virtual presence up in um, North Carolina. Um, you don't forget about my blog. I'd love for you to kind of follow the blog. So there's the uh, address again. And also, um, if you will search through Crowdcast, we have our fourth annual Functional Medicine Symposium for 2021 coming up mid-July. And uh, it is free to sign up for. There'll be some fantastic lectures as there are every year. And um, we, all we ask is that you make a donation to our nonprofit Priority Health Academy.